This is your coffee break. Hi friends, Sarah from the Right Now podcast here. I have with me today Jonathan White, who is the author of Tides, which is a beautiful poetical book that is coming out in February 2017. I'm very excited about it. Very excited to introduce you to Jonathan. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. So you have written this book called Tides, which I have a copy of here. Tell me a little bit about how you got started writing. Well, let's see. I I wrote for the high school newspaper. I actually had my first article published in the Christian Science Monitor when I was 18. And it was about being alone, the value of being alone, spending time alone. After that, feeling encouraged, I started to write more. And I would say that it was a it's been a common thread in my life ever since then. I've had varying success with publication. I wrote uh, some magazine articles. I got plenty of rejection slips. When I was 26, 27, I wrote my first book, which was a collection of interviews about our relationship with nature. That was published by Sierra mm-hmm. Club Books. It was a book called Talking on the Water. And then various other, um, you know, again, um, magazines, newspapers, a lot of the writings about natural history. I kept journals for years and years and years. And uh, so it's just it's just been a common thread. It hasn't always been my livelihood. In fact, it's not my livelihood now, but a common thread as common as anything in my life. So you don't you don't write full time right now. What is your livelihood? I build custom homes. Uh, yeah, I had and no I, idea. Yeah, and I've, I've that has been a common uh, livelihood ever since I graduated from college, and so I do that, and and now I do it. I would say it's been about half time for the last ten years. So half time doing that, and half time either working on conservation work, marine or land conservation, or writing. Do you ever have people say like, wow, you sure have a lot of disparate interests, but it sounds like they all come together. It sounds like the conservation is related to maybe the housing, which is also maybe related to your writing. Tell me a little bit more about how those puzzle pieces all fit together. They do in surprising ways. You know, it apparently seems that they're they're disconnected, especially the building and the writing part. But I am always amazed at how whatever skills I have in both those areas overlap. Like, for example, uh, project management. You know, it's a nuts and bolts business kind of skill, but I really have needed that as a writer. They're all tied together loosely and uh, for different reasons. But yeah, definitely. (laughs) I feel like for me, there's a strong tie between nature and my writing. And I've noticed that with you as well, especially with Tides, which talks about sort of the power of nature over us. Can you tell me a little bit about how nature influences your creativity? Yes, uh, I would say from the very beginning. Again, that's a common theme for me. The, my first book was about exploring our relationship with nature. It wasn't something I planned as a central theme or like writing natural history, but it was something I fell into. It was natural for me to go that direction because I love being out in the outdoors and I love adventure. I've had a life of sailing and being on the water. And so I'm fascinated by the natural world and I'm really fed by it. Um, It's also a source of spirituality for me. Whether I like it or not, I, I'm, I, it's here to stay in my life, I think. you know. I feel like there's such an interesting, you know, when we speak about nature, we speak about um, the spiritual. Like you said, we also talk about the scientific. Can you tell me a little bit about maybe some tensions there or, or how you kind of play with that theme in Tides? I'm really interested in the balance between those two. You know, in the book, I explore a number of different experiences or concepts both with native people and with modern scientists where there's where they're mixed where they're present together and i really really like that and i don't think it's one or the other i think it's both and always and i don't see the contradiction in it for example when i went to the san blas islands to visit the the kunayala indians i don't know if you've got to that part yet but it's mm-hmm. it's the chapter about sea level rise in that chapter, 
uh, or while I was down there, I was visiting with the chief of the village. And this is an indigenous group of people that have been there for hundreds of years, and their lands are threatened by sea level rise. They're a small group of islands off the east coast of Panama. While I was talking with him, he said, we view tides as a, as a spiritual visitor from another dimension. So this is in the context of sea level rise, right? That, that they said during December, these spirits come into the village and to see if um, we're maintaining a, a social equilibrium here. And if, they, if they're satisfied, they return, they go away. But if they're not, they stay. So it's a spiritual message from another dimension. While at the same time, they have scientists within their tribes that are studying all the modern scientists and science about this and understand what's happening with sea level rise. And they're planning as a tribe to move away from the islands in the next, they will have to in the next 50 years. So for them, they live in both those worlds and they've found a way to um, and I wouldn't even say reconcile is the right word because it's not like they're trying to blend it. It's just they can live with both of those things. In the book, in fact, I talk, if you, have you read Tracy Kidder's book, Mountains Beyond Mountains? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do you remember there's a, there's a piece in that book where Tracy Kidder is fo following farmer up into the Haiti farmlands and they, they've walked for days and they get to this small, small village and he's studying the, the, the long-term effects of his work. And this old woman comes up to him, and she says that she's healed now. And he, that, in fact, she had said that voodoo healed me. And he says to her, well, how come you say that when I was administering drugs to you last time? And then she's quiet for a little while, and she looks at him like he's a child and says, don't you understand that your mind has got to be large enough to accept everything at one time? And it's such a wonderful statement, and I, and I actually quote that in the book because it's exactly the way the Kuniyala think, is that it's not like you have to fit them together or make them fit. They can coexist. And I would say that thread is all the way through the book, that you can have a spiritual, mythological perspective of the tide, but you can also have the modern science of the tide, and they don't conflict. Mm -hmm. They can exist together. And the idea for this book, did you have to go search out some of these stories or were you already experiencing some of these stories before you decided to write the book? I can't say that I explicitly saw these things going on in my research uh, originally. You know, I almost lost my boat to a big tide and, and I'd, I'd always spent time with the tide chart because a lot of my activities are on the ocean surfing or, or sailing or diving or whatever. And I always knew the moon had something to do with what was going on, but I didn't know quite what. And then I almost lost my big old boat up in Alaska to a big tide. And afterwards, I thought, okay, it's time to learn something about this. <laughs> okay, what's really going on? And I honestly thought, oh, I'd read a book or two and that would be it. But the more I read, the more fascinating and complex and poetic it became. So, so that's really how my journey began. And I would say that I intuited that there was... So that that really rich mix in there. And then that was really played out in my research when I went to these places, because I went to fairly exotic places and I ended up spending a fair amount of time with indigenous people, like up in the Arctic, the Inuit people or the Panama or down in Chile. So I was all over the place, including meeting monks, you know, modern day Christian monks in Mont Saint Michel in France and having an interview with them, a silent lunch, and then a half hour interview that turned into an hour long interview. But I worked for two years to get that interview. Um, so I was both drawn to that and also the things that were coming forward were enhancing that element of the tide. And I'm, a, I'm as interested in science as I am in the poetry or the or the romance or spiritual nature of it. It's, I'm interested in all of it. And I really feel that it's important not to, you know, like I was saying before, that it's all inclusive. You can have both all views and it's not a conflict. I always appreciate a good paradox. And I feel that that's kind of what we're getting at the, at the crux of here. And so I, I really do appreciate that. I think that we can tend to be very small minded. And I love the idea of expanding to make room for multiple ideas. I'm just so curious. I love travel writing. I love traveling. I love how your mind sort of opens up when you travel. 
when you're looking at getting access to all of these different people you visited, I mean, how did that even work? Do you just call up the the silent monks and be like, hey, can I talk with you? Like, how did you even make some of this happen? Well, in there are lots and lots of stories about that. I would say for every person I talked with, there's a story behind it. But I, I think that, that one of the interesting things is that I found there's a time when you just have to go somewhere mm. because you can't get all the information out of a website or over the internet or over the phone or anywhere, right? Like, and, and a good example of that was the San Blas Islands or Mont Saint Michel or the Arctic. And in all those cases, and in other cases as well, I really did come to a point where I had to close my computer down and say, I just have to go and see what's going on there because I can't get anywhere on the computer. So in each of those cases, I literally just packed up and went, not knowing what I was going to find, not knowing if I was going to find anything. And so like when I went up to the Arctic, the first time it was summertime, and I went up to a little village called Tsuyak, and I just had my backpack, and I stayed in a little trailer hotel, and uh, Tsuyak has 150 people and 250 uh, dogs. Oh, my gosh. And, and millions of mosquitoes. <laughs> and I just walked, I just, you know, every day, I was there for a week, I just walked through the, you know, there's 500 feet of road in the middle of the village, and that's about it a huge tide and I just walked around and listened and watched and, you know, nobody paid any attention to me and, um, you know, heard the dogs howl at night and, you know, wrote in my journal. And, and then as I was leaving, I went to the, the main village. There's 13 villages up there. And this is in Eastern Canada near just South of the Arctic on Hudson Strait area on Gava Bay. And it has one of the largest tides in the world. It competes with the Bay of Fundy for over 50-foot tide. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I was leaving after a week, and I went through Kujuak, which is a capital town. You know, it's again, it's like 500 people. And I'm, at, I'm in the, the only cafe in town, and I overhear some guy talking about going under the ice in the wintertime during low tide to hunt for mussels. And his name was Lucas Napolek. And, you know, I'm eating my French fries and all of a sudden it's like, what? You know, and I waited for him to be finished. And then I went and introduced myself and I said, can you tell me a little bit more about what you were talking about? And he said, yeah, I'm from a little village up in Kengasuyak, up right on the water. And he said in the winter time, when the ice is really thick and there are large tides, meaning large low tides, low, low tides mm -hmm. and high, high tides, we chop a hole in the ice and we go underneath the ice when the tide's out and into those dark, empty cavities and we hunt for fresh blue mussels down in, underneath the ice. And in this course of this conversation, he invited me to come. So, you know, of course, I'm, I'm yes, I would love to do this. So it took two years before we found the right time. And I'm calling him, you know, from my house here on the little small island to his place. And, you know, he's sometimes there, or mostly he's out on the land hunting and, or the time's not right, the ice isn't right, the, you know, whatever, the tide's not right. And then one day I called him and he said, it's right, come. Ah. And so I, I, and meanwhile, I had researched and gotten some Arctic gear to rent. And so I was ready. And literally, I took off two days later. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, Puddle jumped all the way up there, you know, small, each one a smaller plane until, you know, I'm in with some cargo gear and landing up there. And I spent a week and we went under the ice two or three times. I have 10 stories like that with this book, you know, that just apparently serendipitously. But it's just about it's about showing up. It's about paying attention you know, being alert. It's about being generous and open and listening. It's, uh, if I, can I tell one more story? Quick oh one. Oh my like gosh. That? Yes, please. So this is, this is a good example of one on the opposite side. So that was an indigenous, very wilderness kind of thing. This is one about Mont Saint Michel. And in this case, again, I couldn't find any information. I couldn't connect with anybody. I couldn't find out what was going on. So I just decided I'm just going to go. Well, I went, and the first time was in the summertime. And I don't know if you've been there before, but it is a major tourist destination. 
not only because it's a gorgeous castle, you know, monastery that's built like a drip wax castle over an island. I mean, it basically just covers this island. And it's in the large uh, bay that has the largest tides in mainland Europe. So it's 45 foot tides. And so when the tide goes out, it's gone 10 miles away and you don't even see it. Oh my gosh. And then when it comes in, it wraps all the way around the monastery. So it's been a feature of the monastery for well over, you know, 1500 years. The monastery was built in the 700s <laughs> and Benedictines took it over and then recently a Jesuit group. So I'm walking through the village and there's thousands of people, tiny little cobble streets and it's shoulder to shoulder and they're selling crepes and, you know, all kinds of tourist stuff. And I'm thinking, how do I get to the heart of this place? And where's the heart? Where, where is it? And how do I get there? And so I'm just, and it's like this mantra in my mind as I'm wandering along. And I'm, so I stop by a bookstore and I talk to them about books and about what's going on. And pretty soon I'm at the top of the monastery, which is way up there. And I, I take off my backpack and I'm taking pictures and whatever. And then I leave and I left, I left my backpack up there. Oh. Accidentally, and it was stolen. And in it was my passport and a bunch of other stuff. And I connected with one of the guides, a French woman who spoke English and was did the English tour. I mean, they have, this is a major place, right? I mean, millions of people come here every year. Well, to make a long story short, she helped me get through it all, report to the police and et cetera, et cetera. But she also, we became friends in the process, and she agreed to help me with research through mm. the year. So one of the things I wanted to do was was interview the monks because they were inaccessible. They just kind of disappeared in these, you know, big wooden doors. They just disappear behind there with their robes kind of flapping and they're gone. They just they're kind of mysterious. So, again, to make a long story short, she and I crafted letters to the monks over a two year period. It took me two years to get permission wow. from the monks to come and interviewed them. And it finally came in the form of a, a letter saying, you could come and as long as you let us review what you write, you can come and have a silent lunch with us for a half an hour and then we, or, or silent lunch and then an interview for a half an hour. And uh, so I, he said, you could pick any time in this period. So I picked the full moon, a large tide, and I went and I spent a whole week at the monastery mm. and only one small piece of it was the interview with the monks. But it was extremely powerful. And even to her, who's worked at the monastery for four years, we both came out of that time with the monks and said, you know, we have to change our life. We have to change what we're doing here. We have, she said, I have to change the reason I come here every day. And I said, and I have to change the reason I come to see the tide. And uh, so it was really, really profound. But an example that, you know, you can't, how you get into these places and how, how it happens to you or how showing up is important. It's, it's, uh, it's a miracle. It really is a miracle. And that's another thing that came out of this book for me is, and totally unexpectedly, but I've always loved people and have a lot of faith in people. But this book, took it to a whole nother level because the generosity that I'm, <laughs> I'm crying. I'm no. sorry. The, the generosity that people showed um, in almost every case was it just blew my mind that people are so willing to share what they know and to sit with you and to, to participate in conversation and speculation. I mean, just phenomenal, phenomenal. One of the reasons I do this podcast is to try and facilitate some kind of community like that among writers, because I, I feel like we're so, we, we can isolate ourselves so easily. And I, I really admire what you've done in your writing, and that is to go out to people and to create this community and to commune with people when so many of us are at home scribbling at our desks and never and never going out into the world. So I I love that you did that. Would you have any advice for writers who are maybe a little bit introverted or maybe a little nervous about going out and talking to people, interacting with people? 
Oh, and I, I, well, I would say I'm always nervous before I meet somebody and especially interview. Mm -hmm. And I, I, if I was in your shoes right now, I mean, I would have been, I, I mean, I was anyway, but starting an interview, there's always that, I don't know, what is that fear that yeah. it's like, what is going to happen? Maybe nothing will happen. Maybe everything will happen, but it's like, and you know, it's just, it's just phenomenal. So the, the advice would be, I know it's scary and I think everybody feels that, but it's so rich. I would just say, you know, plug your nose and jump in. <laughs> go for it. Just go, you know, do it, show up. Yeah, I mean, I really, if I interviewed over 100 people for this book, there were two people that said no, you know, or somehow shut me down, you know. Um, you know, I got ripped off. You know, I pl I paid a, a Kunayala lawyer who was going to help me to, to, you know, actually be my connection. And he wanted a thousand dollars as a retainer to do this. And I did that in good faith and hmm. never heard from him again. So, you know, stuff, it's not like, you know, I'm immune to that kind of experience. But overall, predominantly, very positive and encouraging. Yeah. One of the things that I got, I, I was very, very lucky early on that I found connections to the world's best scientists. And mm -hmm. I really mean that, the world's best tied scientists. And there's like, there's four of them <laughs> on the planet right now. And it's Walter Monk, who's now over 90. And he was early on at Scripps Oceanography in San Diego. And he's still there. And then Chris Garrett, who's now in uh, Victoria, B.C., over on Vancouver Island. Well, so he's British, and he's uh, one of the world's best tide scientists also. And then David Cartwright, who wrote one of the seminal textbooks on tides. I got really, really lucky that I connected with these guys. And, and they, they, in a sense, they took me under their wing. So I, I had access to them. David Cartwright invited me. Um, over the internet to come and have lunch with him at the Royal Society in London. And that was my introduction to the Royal Society, which then became a chapter of the book. Again, the, just uh, the kind of generosity. If I hadn't had the connection with those three guys, the book would have been really, really different. And I knew also, because they were checking my work and because I was getting it from them, that it was really solid. Um, I talk to a lot of fiction writers on this show, but I, not a lot of nonfiction writers. And so I really appreciate that point of view that like, yes, I needed to talk to these experts. And I'm so glad that they were able to be an authority and do fact checking and all of that stuff. So when you were putting this book together, who did you envision would be reading it? Well, I had, uh, I had a few people, very specific people in mind that I was writing to or for. And they were my, in some ways, imaginary barometers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, would Linda understand? I mean, is that too much for Linda or too little for Linda? You know, Tom, what would he think about that? And then literally I had people like that that were reading it. So it was a lay reader, but, you know, somebody who's intelligent, informed, somebody who's interested in the natural world, maybe particularly interested in the ocean, um, which is a lot of us. <laughs> I had a huge team of people working with me because I believe in teams. I'm, I, I am a people person if you haven't gotten that already. <laughs> so, I'm so, so surprised. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but I'm an introvert in a lot of ways too. So actually the hours and hours alone in the office or writing is, I love that also. But I, but I love it because there's a balance. Mm -hmm. There's the other thing too. But I had a, I assembled a team of, four, five, six people who were reading my, my work all the time. And some of them I paid, some of them were professionals, and some of them were just friends who were really engaged. I used to talk about gates, that, that, it, that my, my writing had to go through certain gates, you know, before it got to, it has to go through Chris, and then it has to go through Donna, and then it has to go through Mike, and then it has to go through Tom. <laughs> and I had them lined up at a, in a very particular order. Because it has to go through Chris before it can go through Mike. And then it has to go through Mike before it gets to Linda. <laughs> so you had to plan that out ahead of time, like set up your yeah. gates. And were these yeah. beta readers? Is that what they were? I wouldn't say they were. Well, m yeah, maybe. But they weren't random test people because we did that later, too. Gotcha. Right. But, you know, I, I mean, really, I mean, if you expand that other circle, because we did send it out to five test readers. They hadn't read anything before. Right. So they were random people. They didn't know me. 
as a market test. We did that. Um, so that, they would be on the outside of the circle. If you conclude all of them, it's probably 25 people that were looking at this and scrutinizing every word. I remember, you know, I'd get stuff back thinking I was done and they were all marked up. And one of the last gates was, I think you could do better. <laughs> oh, how did that make you feel? <laughs> well, I got used to it. And it's true. That, I mean, really, again, I owe it to these people, you know, because without them, the book would be half of what it is without their help and their, their guidance and their pushing me. Within your book, there is some beautiful photography. There's some photography out on your website. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, first of all, a lot of the, a lot of the photographs on my website were taken by me, but um, most of the photographs in the book were not. We're not. So um, this may not be exactly what you're asking, but it, in terms of how it was organized, I hired a photographer editor right, that we worked together mm -hmm. while I was writing the book. And like I said, some of these photographs were mine. She looked through all of mine. We talked about that. But then she did, she searched for other photographs. I did the same thing with a cartographer. All those maps were developed by us for the book. Those weren't pulled from anywhere else. Same with all the figures. I created all those figures with an artist. So cool. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's unusual for that to happen. But each, everything there in that book was created for the book. And then I also worked with a, a sketch artist mm -hmm. who did um, five or six different sketches for the book. So, um, yeah, there, were, there was quite a team involved in that. Um, but my own photographs, I, I take photographs, but the challenge I found is I, if I'm out there, and maybe you've discovered this too, but if I'm out and about, if I have a camera, then I'm taking pictures. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the world through the camera lens. And I'm thinking about constructing images with the camera. I'm not thinking about writing. I don't think about writing. It's a total distraction from writing. Mm -hmm. And vice versa. If I'm writing, I don't know what it is. It's a different part of the brain or the heart or whatever that it's engaged in the world in a different way. I mean, you could say literally it's I'm trying to create words and description as, a, as opposed to visual images. But it's more than that. It's, uh, so I can't do both very well together. So like in like Mont Saint Michel, when I was there for a week, there were days where I just took my camera, and that's all I did. I was just taking pictures, and then um, and days when I was writing, I didn't want the camera around. But it's not I, it's not like I'm calculating that. It's just I just know I can't do both at the same time. Throughout this adventure, what was I guess sort of the biggest surprise for you? Mm, surprise! Wow, I was always surprised. <laughs> I mean, really, I was. There's so many different um, elements of the tide about that world that was surprising. For example, you know, the tide rubs against the bottom of the ocean, right? It creates friction. And it's like our rubbing our hands together that creates heat. Oh. So that happens when the tides are moving in the bottom of the ocean. And some of that friction, heat, is dissipated into the ocean. But most of it, goes into uh, an energy that slows down the rotation of the Earth and hence is actually making our days longer because the Earth is moving slower because of the tides. And that same friction is pushing the moon away from the Earth oh at the rate of about 10 feet in a human lifetime. So the moon that causes the tide is also being pushed away by the tide. And so, you know, and there are just dozens of little pieces like that about the tide that just kind of blow your mind. There's probably a water wells in South Dakota where you are that produce more during high tide and less during low tide. There is a, a PhD uh, oceanographer that I sat with, a woman named Emily Carson, who's just all over the tide. And she gave, she told me the story in the first chapter of the whelks that she's discovered that go travel all the way up with the new tide. Fascinating story. And she, she said, I am sure that we are going to find that there are so many other things that are connected to the tide than we even imagine right now. And I think that's, I really think that's true too. Like, for example, the relationship between tides and seismic activity, there's got to be a connection there, but we don't know it yet. We don't know what that is. And certainly with worldwide weather, with tides and mixing and so forth. But 
I know that might not have been exactly what you're looking for about surprises, but surprised about people and generosity, surprised about um, just how interrelated the tides are with everything, uh, surprised about the spiritual elements of it that are still alive, you know, within these indigenous cultures especially, and just how much people feel about it. You know, like, like I, I, I spent a day with a young musician in Venice, and, you know, they, they are creating these gates to prevent the tide from flooding Venice. Yet it still does all the time. And people live with it just like people do live with rain in Seattle. Um, but he said, I'm not so sure I want the gates to stop the tide. I, I grew up with the tide. I, I sailed my little boat. I made a little wooden boat and I sailed it in San Marco Square when the tide was high. And I, so I don't know that I really I don't want it to go away. You know, so things like that, that are just really, really interesting pieces that are really personal, right, that are connected to this. So um, lots of surprises. <laughs> I love that. I'm one of those people who's just very curious about everything. And so I love seeing surprises and everything. And it seems like you just kind of met surprises every step of the way. So if people are interested in getting their own copy of Tides or visiting you online, where can they find you? Where, sh where should they go? Well, uh, my website is uh, jonathanwhitewriter.com, and there's a, there, there are ways to connect with me there, and it also has, has a lot of information there. And the, I think the books are available basically wherever books are sold these days, um, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or indie bookstores. The official release date was the 21st of February, but the books are already out. Jonathan, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad we finally got to connect. I am so glad that I have a copy of this beautiful book. I am so glad to have met you. I, I just can't say enough good things. So thank you for being a guest today. I, I would love to talk to you again soon. This was just wonderful. Yeah, I'd love to too. Thank you so much. I, I really, really appreciate this. Bye.